Good morning. How are you doing? Um, so, we're in Bangkok. The scene of Hangover 3, basically. <laughs> some of you can aspire to that. Some of you have lived it already. Um, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about at all. So, uh, today we're going to, in this opening session at this great conference on uh, transformation, we're going to... Thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about transforming innovation with you. We have about uh, 45 minutes, so we'll go to a little after 10. Um, uh, don't, don't get too anxious when you think the coffee is disappearing uh, because we knew we'd start slightly late, so we're going to finish uh, slightly over for coffee, but not too much. Um, I'm going to help you think about, um, first of all, what my Twitter handle is. Uh, I have, you can help me get up to 30,000 followers on Twitter. I'm 29.6K now, so if you can get 400 tweets out today, um, uh, we can get up to, or 400 more followers, uh, we can get up to 30,000. Um, probably most of them are dead, I've no idea where they are, or, or if they still exist, but, but that, that's the number. Um, this is what we'll do today. So I'm going to begin by uh, helping us think about what's the difference between innovation and improvement. They're both the kind of change. Uh, but what's the difference between them? How do you know when you're improving? How do you know when you're innovating? Uh, then I'm, I'm going to take a, like a big favorite term that's going on now about disruptive innovation, and I'm going to contrast that with disciplined innovation and say that we need a bit of both. So, uh, so one of it is a bit more about um, continuity, rigor, trial and testing. The other is about blowing things open and thinking out of the box. We need a bit about both, so I'll talk about that. I'll say a tiny bit, not much, uh, but a tiny bit about old pedagogies and new pedagogies. Uh, there's a tendency to think uh, old, old pedagogies look like this, and you talk from the front, and people sometimes put their hands up. Most people get bored and fall asleep, and they sit in rows, and we, we examine everybody, and those are bad old face-to-face -face pedagogies, and instead, we want new, fabulous, digital pedagogies where everybody's online, teachers don't talk anymore, and everybody's a facilitator, and that's the contrast between them, and I want to say it's a bit more complicated than that and just set that out. And actually, if you don't recognize that, you'll alienate many people you're trying to bring into, into innovation because it implies that everything they did in the past was wrong or bad or wicked. So we need to get into the complexity of it a little bit. Uh, and, and last, we'll go into the four Bs of uh, transferring and transforming uh, innovation. And I'll outline what those four Bs are. They're not African bees or queen bees or um, any other kind of flying bees, but their four words begin with B, and we'll, we'll see what those are, and they'll help you think about uh, what you do when you take an innovation from one place and you want to transfer it somewhere else or spread it out somewhere else over time. So this is where we're going. There's going to be a couple of moments for interaction with people next to you at your uh, tables. And uh, first we're going to think about improvement and innovation, and we will start with a question. If your school were a horse, what kind of horse would it be? Okay, very simple question. Uh, this is going to be a couple of minutes. Uh, turn and talk with the person next to you. If your school were a horse, what kind of horse would it be? There you go.
Thank you. I'm, I'm now going to walk randomly around the room and ask about uh, six people for what kind of horse it would be. Uh, because of the volume, uh, I will repeat what people say. Uh, if you have uh, no idea or you're not prepared to share uh, what kind of horse you are in public, uh, or indeed any part of a horse that you might be in public, you can't share that, then we'll, you just say pass and we'll move on to the next person. I'm going to take about six, I'll uh, tap you on the shoulder or otherwise in a culturally appropriate way, I'll indicate, I will indicate to you and uh, let's take about uh, six, there's, there's no particular order. This lady here, what kind of horse is your school? Workhorse. It is a workhorse, okay. It's a workhorse. Um, this lady here, what kind of horse is your school? A horse that is for racing. It is a racing horse. It is a... Racing horse. A racing horse. Yes. A race horse. Yes, a race horse. A race horse. A race horse. A work horse. Uh, this gentleman here. Uh, a Clydesdale. A Clydesdale horse. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Which is, a Clydesdale's like a big farm horse, a show horse, isn't it? So, a bit of a show pony, this school. Okay, good. And uh, we'll take, uh, any more? Any more that we haven't had yet? Any other kind of horses in this room? Uh, yeah? Young and wild and untamed. Young, young, wild and untamed. Are you talking about yourself or your school? Okay. I wish I still was. Okay, good. Young, wild... And untamed. I'm probably going to put this up here, then it is a little bit louder. All right, and uh, was there a hand up back here? Yeah, yeah. Seahorse, we think. A seahorse. <laughs> a seahorse. Okay. So, I ask you this question for a reason. When we think about change, there are at least two, two eyes to change. Uh, one is improvement and the other is innovation. Improvement is a mop with nicer pieces at the end and a better handle. Innovation is a swiffer or a helper, okay, some of you. Improvement is a traditional propeller plane with better propellers or more propellers. Innovation is a jet engine. Improvement is a better phone or a better computer or smaller computer or a better TV, bigger TV. Innovation is an iPhone that has all three in the same place at the same time. This is the difference. They're both important, but this is the difference between the two. If we think of it in terms of horses, it looks like this. So, here's innovation on the top, and here's improvement down the side. As a school, if you're not improving, you're not getting any better, and you're not innovating, you're not doing anything different. You're a dead horse, basically. You are lying on the back with the flies buzzing around you. This is the one cell you really don't want to be in. If you're improving, but you're not innovating, you're a better kind of horse. You're a faster horse. You're a stronger horse. But you're still a horse. Because as we know from those of you who are old enough, a horse is a horse, of course, of course. And no one can talk to a horse, of course, that is, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. Red. I didn't plan to do that, by the way, it just kind of came upon me. Then, if you're innovating, but you're not improving, what are you? You're a fabulous horse. You're a fantastical horse. You're a horse that is so wonderful, it couldn't possibly be. It's innovative, but it might not be improving anything. Not all innovation 
leads to improvement. Okay? Uh, these are the horses that parents and the public often worry about. You know, you, you think you're doing bottom left or bottom right, they think you're doing top right. They just think you're a weird and wacky horse that they can't understand anymore. So, what do you want to be? You want to be bottom right. This is an iron horse, which is what in North America, actually before North America, they called the railway. It has horsepower. It's not a horse, but it does a lot of the work that a horse used to do, just in a very different way and much more effectively. So the first thing to get a hang of is it's important to innovate and it's also important to improve, both of those things. Sometimes you just want to focus on the improvement, make incremental changes. Every so often you may need to make a, make a big leap in something. When you make your big leap, don't, don't forget about the improvement aspect as well as the innovation aspect. And this leads us to a second theme coming up. And that is the difference between disruptive innovation and disciplined innovation. If you've heard of disruptive innovation, could you raise your hands? Lots of you. If, if you think it's more of a good thing than a bad thing, could you raise your hands? All right, look around here. If you think it's more of a bad thing than a good thing, could you raise your hands? One. Talk to him afterwards. Because, because we learn more from people who are different from us than ones who are the same. Right? And my colleague Michael Fullen says, if there are two of us in the same room, and we both agree on everything, one of us is irrelevant. So, so the person who's the naysayer, the oddball, the weirdo, uh, the one who has the one point of view that nobody else has, go and talk to them afterwards, because you'll probably learn more from them than you will from all the other people around you. Let's talk a bit about disruptive um, innovation. Do you know where it comes from, disruptive innovation? Because somebody said to me yesterday, you know where everything comes from. It's not true, <laughs> but I know where this comes from. But let's look at an example first. All right. So, whoops, uh, I need audio. Sorry, let's go back. Could I have audio, please, from the technician? Here we go. I'm hoping this will work. We didn't try this. That was a mistake. Let's see if this works. But I'm going to ask you a question before I do. That is, uh, and if you were watching, you may have just got a hint of an answer, but if you're stuck in the middle of nowhere and, and you want a bottle of wine because you love wine, and it's not a screw top, it's an old-fashioned cork in the top, and you have no corkscrew, and you have no possibility of... Go Please do not look this up on Google, okay? All right, you have no possibility of getting a corkscrew from anywhere, how do you open the bottle? Uh, talk, to your talk to your partner one minute. How do you open the bottle without looking at Google? Okay? Okay. That, that is a really quick one. I'm, I'm not going to ask you uh, individually, but um, if, if you came up with an answer that had something to do with sticks, 
needles, knives, nail files, uh, fingers, uh, pointy objects of any kind. Don't be ashamed. Could you raise your hand? Okay, you are totally in the improvement paradigm. <laughs> so, basically, you, what your head is doing is it's thinking, I don't have a corkscrew. What's the nearest thing I can find to a corkscrew? That's, that's an improvement paradigm. You're thinking, what is the thing you lost or you don't have? And so, what can you get that is something like it? Uh, here's, assume, let's hope the sound works because we didn't uh, check it. But, but let's look at another way of uh, opening a bottle of wine when you do not have a corkscrew available. Here we go. What about that? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this, this is the most important thing you will learn today, okay? Uh, however, uh, those of you who were out with me for dinner last night will know that if I did this, all the wine would go straight over my trousers, all right? because uh, all the beer did last night. This, this is a disruptive uh, paradigm. Uh, it's an innovation paradigm, not an implementer. It's saying, what is a completely different way we can think about of, uh, of opening this? So, let's look at disruptive innovation, first of all. Uh, it, it comes from a man called Clayton Christensen, who is the guru, the source point, of the idea of disruptive innovation. And many years ago, uh, he wrote a book in tiny print uh, that Harvard Business Press published and thought it would sell nothing at all. It, it was actually a book about the history of disk drives. So nobody imagined anybody would go rushing out buying a book on the history of disk drives. And what Christensen said was this. He didn't just focus on disk drives, he focused on other things as well. But with disk drives, he said, when you have disk drives, over time, of course, they get smaller. The technology improves. As they get smaller, it, it brings incremental improvements to your machine. <coughs> so you get a slightly smaller machine or something more, something more compact. And, but every so often, when, as the disk drive gets smaller, there's a leap in what you're able to do. Uh, so you go from a desktop to a laptop. And then we went from a laptop to a palm top. It creates something totally different. And it describes how with IBM, when, when the disk drives led to a leap in technology, the people inventing them, the innovators, the innovators come forward to the management and say, well, we've got this new thing here, it's... It's, it's, you know, it's smaller than a laptop, it's, it, it's a palm top, it can do it, you can carry it around with you, eventually it became a tablet of course, you can carry this around with you, and, uh, and management says, let's ask our customers. So they go out and survey all their customers, and the customers say, well it's interesting, but the thing is, yeah it's smaller, and I like the look of it, but we'll lose memory. And I don't want a smaller memory. I want to keep all the memory I've got on my computer. So it's interesting, but, I'm, uh, but I don't really want this. So the management says, sorry everybody, uh, interesting innovation, thanks very much. Customers don't like it, get back to work. The customer is not always right. The customer often does not know what they yet want and what is in the future. Uh, Nokia who were once the biggest producers of mobile phones in the world. I've got, I've 
studied a history of Nokia because I looked at education in Finland and wanted to look at the whole uh, culture and history of Finland where Nokia is hugely important. So I read the history of Nokia. There's a picture of Mikhail Gorbachev with the first mobile phone. It's this big when he visited Finland. It's like a plank of wood, okay? And so Nokia made, made their name really like Blackberry um, by having a device where you use your thumbs like this. So people use the thumbs like this for years all the time. And then one day somebody from innovation in Nokia came forward and said, we got this new technology. Uh, it doesn't involve doing this. It involves swiping stuff with your fingers. So Nokia said, well, we'll have a look at it. So they had a look at it. And I said, no, that's silly. Nobody's ever going to do that. Nobody's ever going to swipe stuff with their... People like doing this. They don't like doing that. So the innovators went to North America, to California. And guess what happened next? The invention of the iPhone did not occur with Nokia. It occurred with somebody else. Because Nokia established long-established companies and organizations favor incremental innovation over disruptive innovation. When they start, like a new school that's built and everybody loves it, and you appoint people who remind you of you, and you're all on the edge and bold pioneers, you're all disruptors. You think you're disruptors because you're new and you're different and you have technology and your, your spaces are different and the furniture's different. By the way, we're sponsored by a furniture company. Where are you? Where are you? Yeah, I did a conference about 10 years ago in New Zealand. It was sponsored by a furniture company. And a person said, our family's just taken over this company. And when we took over the company, before we did, we researched it. And we found that the company we've taken over produced furniture for two kinds of institutions. Schools and prisons. It was the same furniture, okay? The identical furniture for schools and prisons. So they came in to school furniture with a different vision of what kind of space, or what kind of furniture people needed in order to support learning rather than imprisonment. So the schools on the edge of this that start up at first feel like pioneers, feel like disruptors, feel like they're breaking the mold, and they are. The harder ones are the schools that, have, that were innovating 30 years ago and I now, now know what their innovation is. Their innovations become institutionalized and they don't want any other innovations. Desks, rows, asking a question as a teacher you know the answer to. That's a weird thing, isn't it? You know, how many other occupations do people get in conversation and ask questions they already know the answer to? Imagine this over dinner. We're sitting around over dinner and, um, and you say, so, what do you think of the chicken? And your guests say, oh, it's really tasty. Good, good, well done, well done. How, how, how in what way would you describe it? That's tasty. Um, well, it's, you know, like the gravy's nice and the wine sauce and so on. Excellent, excellent. Well, I mean, if we talk to people like this over dinner, they'd think we were nuts. But we don't. We go into a classroom and we think this constitutes normal conversation, which is to ask questions we already know the answer to, but to spend 40 minutes getting the kids to guess their way to what the answer to the question is and orchestrating the entire event so it will occupy their time and their mind and their behavior for the spell of the whole lesson. Where does that all come from? It comes from the 19th century. It comes from the Prussian army. It comes from Scottish factories. And it comes from the monasteries which created this infernal thing called the bell. All of those were innovations when they began but they became institutionalized. People become attached to them and they cannot imagine anything else. So innovations happen. All innovations are disruptions, but then they become institutionalized and people resist other innovations 
unless it's in some weird and wacky group of eccentric people in a bizarre building in a corner of the town where all the deviant teachers go to start their careers. Are you with me so far? I exaggerate a bit, but, but not completely, okay? But what happens then is this thing starts over here, and when this thing starts, so the first uses of um, iPhone technology were actually on dashboards for GPSs. They had nothing to do with, uh, with anything else. The first, when disk drives became smaller and uh, small computers, they went on, and people in IBM thought, oh, well, we can ignore that. That, that will be no threat to us whatsoever. And then what happens, says Christensen, is the technology moves northeast. It goes up in status, which is, so many innovations in school begin with, pardon me, because you know I don't really mean this, with thick kids. With kids who can't achieve or nobody else wants. So you think, well, we might as well innovate, innovate with them because nothing else works. And so they let you do what you like because you're kind of right at the bottom. But what happens over time is if it starts to work, it goes north into higher status groups. They want creativity for their kids as well. They want project-based learning. They want connection to the environment and a sense of place. It moves north in terms of status and out in terms of reach. And suddenly, the big company is overtaken by the upstart alternative that it abandoned as a child. The child comes back to eat its own parents. That is what happens. It kills off its own parents. This is the brilliant argument that Christensen made. The difficulty is other people have turned this into a mandate and a prescription. They've said schools are broken. They're factory schools. They're all desks. They're all lines. Teachers are boring. Kids are bored. And so we need to disrupt it. We need to abandon the traditional school. We need to have online schools. We need teachers to stop talking. We don't want any Ken Robinsons anywhere. We just want quiet, humble, insipid facilitators in our classrooms for our kids. That's all we want. And it's an exaggeration. It's taken a good idea, which often happens in education, and turned it into a mandate and a prescription. We do want disruption, we do want new ideas, but we don't want people other than teachers coming along telling teachers that they have to abandon everything they've done for an unproven new paradigm. Instead, what we want is disruptive innovations that, responsibly, we then test and trial to see if they work. So I'm going to show you two pictures now. First of all, you're going to tell me what this is. Uh, not this, but the next one, but this. All right, because I'm going to go through this one quickly so you don't see it. What is this? It is a Dyson, okay? It is a Dyson. It is not a vacuum cleaner, it is a Dyson. So, Sir James Dyson uh, basically revolutionized house cleaning technology by not just getting a better a vacuum cleaner that kind of sucked up the dirt and put it into a bag. I mean, vacuum cleaners are weird. You suck up the dirt, right? And dirt's disgusting. So what you do is you put it into a bag where nobody can see it. Then you put a pair of rubber gloves on. Then you take the bag out of the vacuum cleaner and you, you put it in a bin liner. So now it's inside two bags, which is where dirt needs to be. And then you put the bin liner in the dustbin, in the trash bin. So now it's inside three containers, which is exactly what you should do with disgusting dirt. And what Dyson said instead was fascinating. He said, dirt will be entertainment. We will create this thing called the Dyson. And it will go around with, with jet water whizzing around. It will mix the dirt with the water. And it will go around at several hundred miles an hour in a transparent tank and we will be able to watch it. It'll be better than cable TV. <laughs> it, it, uh, it, turned, it took an idea, which is dirt is disgusting, and turned it on its head and said dirt is entertainment. The weakness will be the strength. So I came up with this brilliant idea of the Dyson. But then, it didn't just put it out and say, right, we've invented this now, off you go. 
because they might, they might break. You know, the dirt might blow out and blow people's heads off. So in industry, uh, responsibly, we test things. We trial things. We refine them over time. We create things called prototypes. How many prototypes do you think the Dyson had before it went to market? 40. 50. Do I hear any more bids? 200. Any more than 200? I have 200. 200 down on here. How many? 1,000. I hear 1,000. From Iceland, I hear 1,000. 200 down here, 1,000. Do I hear any more bids on 1,000? Okay. Now, so, if you don't test a Dyson properly, you'll probably get a dirty house. If you don't test an innovation properly with kids, you may lose a whole year or two. May lose a generation. If you say all the kids are going to have iPads before the teachers know what to do with the iPads, you may lose a whole year or two years. Uh, I've seen this in lots of places, in schools I've been studying. They say, this year we're going to introduce iPads to everybody. People don't know what to do with them. Why aren't we testing them? We should disrupt, but we also need to be disciplined. Have the big ideas, open them up, try them and test them. Try them with a bit of the curriculum before all of the curriculum. Try them with some kids rather than all kids. Try them with some of teachers' time before you try it with all of teachers' time. Try it with some of your teachers before all of your teachers. But trial it, learn, test it, refine it. Be disciplined as well as disruptive. Not either or. It's both, most things are both and. They're not either or. Are you with me so far? Okay, so this is the second thing. There's two more to go. How are you doing? Good, okay. Here's the third thing. Old pedagogies and new pedagogies. Again, this is not either or, it's both and. So, I love grids, by the way. Uh, if, uh, when I get through disruptive innovation, I'll start using circles. But at the moment, I stay with two by two grids. So, uh, new pedagogies are um, things we haven't done before. Many might be with uh, technology. They might be things like Minecraft, uh, games, uh, video learning, gaming learning, uh, simulation, second life. Could be many of these things. Many new pedagogies are also technological. Um, but they're old pedagogies and not all of them are bad. The pedagogies of, of John Dewey were not bad. The pedagogies of Montessori were not bad. The pedagogies of, critical, of Paulo Freire are used with 25,000 schools in Colombia that outperform the regular schools and go back to the 1960s. Not all old pedagogies are bad. Some of them, not old pedagogies, are old, uninteresting teachers droning on in front of their disengaged classes. Some old pedagogies are good. We need to distinguish the good from the bad, whether it's old and whether it's new. And some new pedagogies are not so good either. They're superficial, fads, flashy. Test them out, see if they work. Keep the ones that do, abandon the ones that don't. So we need to distinguish old pedagogies and new pedagogies, good pedagogies and bad pedagogies. What we want are good old pedagogies and good new pedagogies. And if you get that discussion going in your school, you'll bring with you many more of your long-standing teachers who've been there with you for t in the career for 20 or 30 years. If you say we want only new, new pedagogies, they'll feel that everything they've done has been disvalued and cast aside. Are you with me so far? Okay, here's the fourth thing. I'm usually funnier than this. Here's the fourth thing. Okay, there isn't a fourth thing. Here we go. Let's try this. So, just to illustrate this, here's a school in Iceland. Uh, those of you with me yesterday saw this. I was there a couple of years ago. Uh, in parts of the curriculum, the kids are doing this. They're doing arts. Uh, it's part of the curriculum uh, every week for a significant amount of time. 
Arts are what counts as part of excellence. So it looks like this. But in the school you'll also see this. Kids counting the times tables as they're going up the stairs. It is not either or. It's both and. We need, we, we need moments when people do just remember basic things that are hard to remember. This is what learning music is like. You want to play a fantastic jazz improvisation, at some point you've just got to learn your scales as well. You've got to learn the things deliberately in a grueling way, with self-sacrifice. Not all learning is happy and fun. Some is tortuous and involves suffering. Ask any Olympic athlete, was it always fun and enjoyable? No, Olympic athletes often throw up before their performance. I'm not recommending throwing up as a strategy for improving teaching and learning. But it involves both. It involves discipline, sacrifice, hard work, routine, and also breakthrough, creativity, innovation, combination of unusual ideas. It's not either or. It's both and. And, and communicate this to your colleagues at school. So, the four Bs. What are these and how can we look at them? The four Bs are, make us think, when you take a good innovation from somewhere that's going on in one or two schools or one or two systems and you think, this is interesting, how can I bring it into my school? What do you need to know? Well, a classic example is this. This is a bit hard to see. This is a friendship bench, in a, so I apologize to all the people I was with yesterday. The last 15 minutes you've had some kind of version of before, so you can just go to sleep, switch off now, okay? Uh, go on Skype, whatever you want to do. So, this is a friendship bench in a school in Norway. Uh, in the last uh, year, my colleague Michael O'Connor and I have been doing a study of collaboration and designs for collaboration in five countries. So five designs for collaboration, because collaboration is itself an innovation. Five designs of how to collaborate in five different countries. And you can find this, so just Google my name, and Michael O'Connor's with the Wise Foundation. Um, this came out in November, you'll find it online, and the book will be out in May with, with Corwin. And in this book, Collaborative Professionalism, uh, we're basically saying it's not only important to collaborate, but it's important to collaborate in particular ways that are both more deep and more trusting, built on solid relationships that, that the administrations established with the staff, the staff with each other, uh, the teachers with the kids, the kids with each other. So you both need to deepen the relationships. Collaboration's not just about a bunch of teams and tasks and spreadsheets and targets and numbers and interventions and data and being driven by data. So we should never be driven by the data. We are the drivers, not the driven. The data should help us, but it's the sense we make of the data that's important. No brain scan tells a doctor what is wrong with a patient. It is the interpretation and judgment the doctors, plural, bring to the brain scan that help them provide a diagnosis. They are not driven by the data. The data and their judgment and experience come together and this is how it should be in the work that we do. So we looked at five designs, five examples of how people collaborate and it is about relationship, not just tasks, but it's also when you have conversations, when you share your practice, your ideas, that the conversation is rigorous, that the feedback is open and demanding that it raises challenging questions sometimes, that you do things together and you don't just talk about things together, that the collaboration becomes deeper in the relationships and more focused in the tasks in the protocols. It's not either or. It's not the task, structure, meeting, um, anal, retentive, have to have a deadline, a target, a goal, a strategic plan sort of person here, and a kind of flabby 1960s, 70s counselor. It's all about the relationships. We need to know the person over here. It's about both these people working together in a team for the children you know best. 
That is what collaborative professionalism is about, not just stilted tasks and teams or floppy, loose, unpurposeful relationships and interactions. It's the both of them together, and this is what we tried to study. And in one school in Norway, we came across this. It's a friendship bench. A friendship bench. Friendship bench is a very simple idea. Notice, by the way, it's about minus 20 degrees here. And Norwegians believe an important part of learning takes place outside, not inside. So all school assemblies, which is whole school meetings, take place outside even when it's minus 20 degrees. Because in Norway, they say, there's no such thing as bad weather. There's only bad gear bad clothing. So and there's a big movement now, a big innov not all innovations are digital, some of the biggest innovations coming in now are natural, they're about connecting, reconnecting our children to the natural world of play around them that is not overprotected, flattened, cushioned and helmeted. Because when kids spend more time outside, they learn better when they're inside as well. This is a friendship bench. The idea of the friendship bench is simple. If you don't have somebody to play with, you go and sit on the bench and somebody will come and play with you. If you think that's a lovely idea, put your hand up. And in Norway, uh, by the way, as of yesterday, one of the world's five happiest countries, four of them are all in Northern Europe, go on to the BBC website. Four out of five of the countries, Finland, Norway, uh, Iceland, and one of the other Nordic countries, the happiest countries. In Norway, it works. Then they had a discussion on NPR, National Public Radio, in America, about what happened to this idea when it came to the United States and was renamed the Buddy Bench. And what sometimes happened was <coughs> a kid would go sitting on a bench looking for a friend, and in a, the different culture of some parts of the United States, other kids will look at them and say, what a loser. I start to bully them, pick on them, throw snowballs at them. Exactly the same technological invention, totally different culture. You can take the same design and move it to another place and people will use it in a totally different way. The buddy bench is a small example, but there are bigger ones. Hands up if you're from Hong Kong. Lots of you. This is, this is Fan Ling Secondary School College in Hong Kong. This is Veronica Yao. They do lesson study. You go into Veronica Yao's, one of her classes, and on two days a year, a hundred people will come to the school and look at about half the teacher's classes. You go into Candy's class, she's a science teacher, and Candy is teaching energy, thermal energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, how you get one transformed into another. There are two teachers in a class of 35. They're doing things like putting Bunsen burners on and having paper balloons rise into the air. There are no goggles, no helmets, by the way. And then another kid who has visual impairment will be pushing a truck down a track and another kid will be playing a recorder turning the sound of turning the sound of blo the, the energy of blowing into the sound that comes out is this a transformation of energy the teachers ask or is it something else is it waves and then they do this through self-regulated learning so through the class they're teaching this they're teaching this and you'll get Kids who work on their eye boards, little chalk boards, putting down their ideas. They'll do this individually, they'll talk to other kids, and then every so often in groups of four, the kids will go and look at other kids' eye boards and edit them and comment on them. They love it. It's small, it's tactile, they can rub things out, they can put things on. They talk in pairs, they talk in fours, they give feedback. They talk as a whole class. They present their work to the whole class. And then, if this doesn't seem hard enough, while you're doing all this, you've got 12 people watching you. Utterly terrifying. Except, 
It's not Candy's lesson. Candy has planned this lesson with the rest of the science department. All the members of the science department have practiced this lesson. They've given each other feedback on the lesson. They've taught it two or three times. So when Candy gets the feedback, it's not her lesson, it's their lesson. It's not her teaching, it's a lesson. Are you with me so far? It's a lesson, not her teaching. And then, when the teachers come in, they treat the teachers just like the kids. They divide them into groups with chalkboards. The teachers are encouraged, one group, to make critical comments, and they do. They say things like, well, what about the kids? This all goes very fast. What about the kids who can't keep up? Why did the teacher only call on four kids? What about all the other kids in the class? What about the kids at the front who presented and you can't hear them? These are the questions they get. And the teachers answer honestly all the time. And sometimes they say, well, the kids can go fast because in the afternoons before class they prepare. So they're able to keep up with the pace. Other times they say, we don't know, you know, we're worried about this too. They get all their feedback. And they put it on iBoards at the front of the class, just like everybody else. This is lesson study. And then people have tried to take lesson study and move it into other cultures, in Europe and in the United States. And they found it often to be a disaster. Because in Confucian Eastern cultures, feedback and criticism within a culture of respect and hierarchy is essential to self-improvement, which is also a Buddhist and a Confucian principle. It is embedded in the culture and the life and the authority relations of the people. But in North America, people are competitive. And if somebody makes a criticism, it is seen as a way of bringing you down so that they can elevate themselves. And getting open criticism within a professional culture is much more difficult. Many attempts at lesson study moving from Asia to America and other Anglo-Saxon cultures have found it difficult to translate one from the other. These draws attention to the four B's of taking, so I'll have to go through quickly, taking one innovation and moving it to another. Here they are. Think about your school. Think about and how you would tell other people about what you've done. And think about other schools and how they would tell you what they have done. The four B's are, you look at lesson study. Or in northern Canada, professional learning communities run by teachers, not run by principals. Or think of the schools of rural Columbia, where teachers, poor teachers, weakly trained teachers, share their, improve by sharing their ideas with each other as they come across the mountains on their motorbikes to go to micro centers where they watch other teachers teach. The idea here is if the teachers don't know much, how can we improve them? Well, instead of just telling them or making them do things, what well, every teacher knows something, let's move around what the teachers know. Whether you're in any of these places and you look at the design, four questions you should always ask as well as what is the design are, what happened before we saw this design. How long have they been working at this? How many years has the principal been there? How did they used to collaborate informally before they collaborated formally? What happened when it went badly before it went well? How can we know about this? How do we ask about this? What went on before? Secondly, what goes on beyond? How is the school connected to other schools, other places? How do they learn from them? The school in Norway gets training in cooperative learning from Manchester in England and visits schools in Canada and has partnerships with them. The school in Hong Kong has gone to Japan to learn about lesson study and also to Singapore. By the way, all of these schools never go to one place and say, let's copy that. 
They go to more than one place and say, what can we learn from these different things that we've seen and use in our school? Never copy one thing. Look at multiple examples and figure out how it fits your school and your community yourself. And then there's what's beside you. Who are the other schools that support you? What does the IB do? What does your network of English schools or American schools or French schools or Canadian schools do to support you and make, or get in the way and make your innovations possible or difficult? And last, betwixt, what about the culture that you're in? When Veronica Yao collaborates with her staff, Veronica Yao's clearly in charge. She's in charge. She's at the front, and her teacher leader on the right-hand side knows exactly when to come in and contribute. And so does the other teacher on the left. In the mountains of Colombia, the teachers gather and are emotional, and they wave their arms all over the place. And they argue about teaching and pedagogy and politics and communities all at the same time. They're both ways of collaborating, but they are culturally very different. You cannot take one way of collaborating and move it between these dramatically different cultures. But you can take principles of collaborating, build relationships, get to know each other, share what you were doing, work on something together, create a product, not just, co not just conversations, give each other feedback, find a way to do that, learn, inquire, grow over time. All these are core principles of collaborative professionalism. Understand those and how they fit you, not this model that you can copy or that model that you can copy. The culture really matters. Are you with me? This has been a lot, okay, in about 50 minutes. But to sum up, what we've learned about first is the difference between innovation and improvement. Improvement takes something that is and makes it more efficient. Innovation breaks out of the box and does something completely new. Both of them are important. Some innovations need to be disruptive, dramatically different, totally new way of approaching things, and disciplined, test them out, refine them to make sure they help and do not harm your children over time. Disciplined and disruptive, both at the same time. We've learned that when you look at pedagogies, not all the best pedagogies are new and not all the bad pedagogies are old. They're old and new, good and bad. And as a community, figure out together how to keep the best of the old and blend it with the best of the new and put away the bad ideas in both of them. And last, once you've figured out what are the innovations worth having that you've got, that you want other people to know about, and what are the innovations that other people have that are worth having that you want to know about, remember the four Bs. Ask them, what went on before? How long did it take to build? Who supports them at the side? How are they learning from other people beyond them? And what's the fit between them and the cultures? The customer is not always right. The parent who just wants more test scores, more test prep, more private tutoring, more shadow systems of tutoring, all these things, the parent is not always right. The parents, like all other customers. Henry Ford once said, if we'd have asked them what they wanted, they'd have said more horses. The answer is not always more horses, more exams, more tests, more preparation, or even more technology, more gadgets. It is innovation that is sometimes disruptive, always disciplined, connecting the kids to the ways they learn best in the century we're in. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference.